when we're looking at this, you know, we're really playing with the relationship here, roles of power and hierarchy. She's given much more attention. She's wearing a crown. She's in a very elaborate throne, but we're playing with power dynamics. Fine arts illuminate our present and explicate our past. SCAD professors teach brilliant young creators every day. And in this series, we reveal the works that most inspire our experts. This is SCAD Class. Today we step back to ancient Mesopotamia with a relief carving that grants us a glimpse into Assyrian royalty. Joining me is SCAD Professor of Art History, Carrie Brown. Being from the South, I've been to my share of garden parties, but never one with a severed head. Tell me about it. <laughs> well, what we're looking at here is the garden party with a focus on Ashurbanipal, who was king of the Neo-Assyrian Empire at the time, with his queen, Lilibai Sharat, in the garden, surrounded by servants, king of the world, king of Assyria. Best name. Best name ever. Um, when you start to look more closely, you can see that, it's, which catching his gaze across the composition, um, we have an overturned head on a hook hanging from a tree that's sort of commanding his gaze here. A little unsettling. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so he was quite a character. He was from a long legacy of rulers for the Assyrian Empire, and he was considered one of the last great emperors. And the Assyrian Empire at this time was the largest in the world. They had conquered most of Greater Mesopotamia. They've conquered Egypt by this time, and so in the 7th century they're really controlling vast territory. We have some decay and decline after his rule, but uh, Ashurbanipal's reign was really seen as this golden age of the height of majesty, the height of palace architecture, um, and many of these panels that we're looking at would flank the walls of these palaces and really decorate the interiors. We see this sort of legacy of architecture as identity. So when we're thinking about not only the relief carvings, but all of the details in the garments, in the jewelry, so it's all about how he's crafting persona and identity. And the palace is just another level to that mm -hmm. and they were known for their brutality and so some of this was you know balancing the role of the ruler to conquer and vanquish but also this degree of opulence so filling in all checking all the boxes with imperial authority and imperial control it's a juxtaposition of roles of the ruler and where was this found the modern day sites of Nineveh um, parts of northern Iraq today were excavated in the late 19th century, and also we have excavations in the early 20th century. Essentially, we have different delegations of French and British archaeologists sort of digging, um, because the site itself was covered. The archaeological photographs from that time are really striking, because it's as if sort of these large sculptures, and the palace is just coming out of the desert. And so the excavation efforts were well documented. And so this particular panel and others from the North Palace um, were all brought to the British Museum and installed. And it leads to this entire wave of interest in Assyria, this interest that really um, dovetails well with 19th century Orientalism already. What was so striking for many people is how well preserved they are because they were buried. And what colors do you think would have been used in this depiction? In many cases, they're using carnelian, um, lovely lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli was prized in the ancient world. Those little plaques in the crown of the queen. Yeah. So it looks like a crenellated wall of a palace. Yeah. All of those would have been filled with semi-precious stones. Mm. And so we get the sense of like this color palette that's really rich, very vibrant, most likely very bold, anything that would pop. For me, when I'm looking at reliefs, because we don't have a lot of color surviving, you're really relying on the depth of the carving and many of those relief details. So your eyes drawn to the central couple 
flanked by this lovely, lovely grapevine that kind of curls up along the two trees that sort of flank the scene, creates a nice composition. He's elevated up on a seat and a couch. Um, we get a sense that there's also smells and sort of perfume. We can imagine the flowers in the garden, but also in those architectural details, we have little um, piles of incense. So you can get a sense of the whole like sensory experience in addition to you know, the birds that are in the trees tucked away, um, they're all moving in different directions. So you get a lot of observational detail. Um, there's even a little cricket hiding. So there's a lot of hidden uh, elements which make it a tremendous amount of visual appeal, but you can also get a sense of like creating the scene in your mind. Yes, and the fans, the fanning, and what the king and queen are wearing. Right, the garments are lovely. When you're looking at the king and you're looking at the queen, um, they certainly stand out from the rest of the figures in the piece because you have that real level of detail on their garments. I do love their hairstyles. Often there's a lot of treatment to the hair, which has a very similar style, um, going back nearly a thousand years. And so you'll see that, you know, there's an evolution in how beards and hair are usually shown, but it's usually conveying this idealized type. So Ashurbanipal is really sort of manifesting the same visual ideals of his father, his grandfather, those that came before him, um, something that's recognizably Assyrian to differentiate from the other kingdoms at the time. And so it's certainly an Assyrian style of hair, an Assyrian style of beard. And so when we look at all of the ornaments of Ashurbanipal, who's elevated up, um, and then comparing that to the queen, they're very similar in terms of the detail, this really, um, overindulgent statement of wealth. And he could just reach up and pluck a grape if he wanted. What's lovely about this is the grapes sort of go behind his head. And when you look at his hair and the details, he's not really wearing a crown here. It's much more informal. But when we compare that to the queen, she's wearing a formal crown. She's sitting in a formal throne. Um, and some scholars have suggested that she might actually be the focus of the composition rather than Asher Ben and Paul. Oh, and so something. when we're looking at this, you know, we're really playing with the relationship here of how you play with roles of power and hierarchy. So this is the only Assyrian work where a woman is presiding. Right. Holding court. Right. And so it's it it leads to more questions than answers. And so we see two very important people sharing a space. He has to be the most important because he's the ruler, he's the king but clearly the queen also shares that level of importance. So some people have speculated that his sort of more informal attire um, really then creates a messaging related to her power and her authority within the royal court. How hierarchy is shared and how that gets communicated. Generally, the stories that we have related to the Assyrians are fairly brutal. Um, you'll see an emphasis on warfare and violence, but you'll also see um, a lot of dark humor in many really? of the panels, um, which brings us back to the head. This particular head was the head of an Iliamite king who was defeated several years earlier before this garden scene was depicted. There's a lot of visual features which make it recognizable for some distinctive characteristics related to two men, who is the Iliamite king who's shown here, so that it was important for Ashurbanipal to show these visual features. But the other component of this, and what I find so ironic about the entire garden party, the Iliamite king before this great battle of Tiltuba, which took place several years earlier, um, proclaimed that he would beat Ashurbanipal, fighting until the very end, until he's eating dinner in Nineveh. And so this long story of him having dinner in Nineveh, this is spun into Ashurbanipal having him for tea in the garden. So he's finally having his dinner and eating at the court in Nineveh, but he's then there as a totem. Oh my goodness. So you get this bit of dark humor. Yes. Okay, he wants to eat dinner in Nineveh, we'll give him dinner in Nineveh. <laughs> so, you know, there's- Really there's, eat his words, right? You certainly going to eat his words. And it's one of the last things that you're drawn to. You know, you first see the king and you will see the queen. It's very clear that they're the focus. And then if you start to take in the greater scene, you realize there's a lot more hidden details, almost Easter eggs that he's put into the panel to create this longer narrative and make lasting implications about his rule as ultimate authority. So it's a constant reminder that he was still victorious mm -hmm. and they're ultimately victorious 
um, against the Iliamites in 645 when this is carved. Well, an important date then. Yes. When we're dealing with ancient art in um, West Asia in particular, keeping heads, heads as sort of totems, heads maybe as protection or as trophies. Yes. There's all different variations to this. Some people speculate that the appearance of the head in the garden served as a protective function, having some apotropaic functions as related to um, Nineveh and the palace and sort of this continued reminder of the defeat of the Iliamites. After the end of Ashurbanipal's reign, um, Nineveh was invaded and many of the wall panels were um, purposely destroyed. Mm -hmm. The destruction in the iconoclasm was really about removing the power of Ashurbanipal that existed in those, those works. So you can see that there's a tremendous amount of destruction on his face, focusing on the nose and the mouth, right? The breath areas to sort of remove that power. And you see the same level of detail in destroying the nose and the mouth also in the queen's portrait and some of the servants. And so what we know in terms of presence in ancient art, when we're looking at an image, we're usually not just looking at a sculpture of that particular persona or that particular deity. It's a truly an embodiment. And so images with their power um, often became targets. This was a, something that was fairly common yes. um, in most ancient traditions that you'll see that destruction. And so it's really reiterating why these images were so important. What attracts you to this work and why did you choose to talk about this one? I love talking about this work because generally when I first show it to students, I start with the overview and I just ask them what they see. Yes. And so it becomes a conversation and looking closely. You know, people are making choices. They're making choices about what to hold in their hands. They're making choices about how to frame the work. I think, you know, as simple as this is, it's quite complex. And that's why I keep returning to it every time I return to it. I see more details and having those conversations with students in class, they see details I don't see. Hone their observational expertise and uh, hopefully contribute ideas to each other. What's really lovely is they start pointing and they start showing things to each other. And so they're really sharing and collaborating. We talk about like how these elements are really fostering a persona in statecraft just through the image. But we also work through the complexity. So figuring out like where we're looking and the messages being told, the fact that we have the king and the queen sitting at the center and his, you know, weapons are behind him. Behind him. So he's at leisure. He's, he's not at war. He's at leisure. He's not at war. He's literally sipping out of a golden teacup. Um, she's also enjoying her tea. Um, we have servants and we have musicians, right? You can start to imagine this entire world that's created. And I can imagine um, a really fantastic garden party, which just happens to have a head hanging from a tree. <laughs> For all of you watching, keep the conversation going in the comments, and I'll see you next time.